Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for She-Ra Unchained, an episode of She-Ra, Princess of Power, produced by Formation Studios. So here we are with the third episode of She-Ra. Even to this day people seem to be confused by the order of things, thus I'll repeat what I stated in my episode commentary for Into Etheria and Beast Island and start off by summarising the production. The first five episodes of She-Ra were produced as Into Etheria, Beast Island, She-Ra Unchained, Reunions and Battle for Bright Moon, collectively known as The Sword of She-Ra Parts 1 to 5. After production was completed, Filmation decided to edit together the first five episodes of She-Ra, trimming the content for time and releasing it as a movie in theatres titled The Secret of the Sword to better showcase the introduction of She-Ra and capitalise on the huge success of Masters of the Universe. Whilst it's fair to say that the movie wasn't a success in theatres, it has gone on to become one of the more recognisable aspects of the He-Man and She-Ra franchise. I have to say, the direction for this opening is lovely, the shots of She-Ra making her presence felt before she has even made an appearance in an episode. In the last episode, He-Man convinced Adora to see for herself how bad the Horde was. Be sure to check out this episode recap for Beast Island. All these scenes feature new animation and different takes with certain story elements removed in order to speed the recap along. And here we go with She-Ra Unchained, the only episode of the first five not written by Larry Dottilio. This episode being penned by Bob Ford, who had already proven himself a fantastic writer during He-Man's second season with episodes such as The Rainbow Warrior and, of course, The Problem with Power. So here the episode starts with a scene at the Fright Zone with Hordak demonstrating his new Magna Beam weapon, followed by a scene at the Whispering Woods in which Prince Adam says farewell to his rebel friends as he prepares to infiltrate the Fright Zone. However, in the Secret of the Sword version, to make the movie flow, the two scenes are actually swapped around. The episodic nature of She-Ra Unchained enables the story to break up the back-to-back -back scenes at the Fright Zone. However, had the movie kept the same structure, we would have had a Horde scene followed by another Horde scene. It would have been very weird. At last it's finished! A thing of beauty! This is an unusual episode for Hordak himself. For some reason, much of the episode sees him with a robotic arm on the right side. There seems to be no reason why it's just there. I would think this would be a costly mistake for Filmation since none of these sequences of Hordak could be reused again unless a script called for it. His single robotic arm never appeared again in the series, even though it does look rather cool. As we'll see, Hordak also appears to have some sort of transporting power within his belt. He just presses it and everyone reappears in the plunder room. Speaking of the presentation of Hordak, when he blows his way into that very room near the end of the episode, both his arms are cannon, something that would never be repeated in the series and it's a very striking visual. A lot of unique takes were given to Hordak in this episode but the writers seem to take them away almost immediately after. In the opening scenes of She-Ra Unchained we meet Imp for the first time. He serves very little purpose here and immediately sounds irritating and bratty. Whilst he would always be irritating and bratty, this is the only time in the series that Hordak can't seem to stand him. As the series continues, Imp is written as the only one Hordak can trust. Here Hordak reveals his plan to transport the entire Whispering Woods to the Valley of the Lost. Much like Beast Island, the Valley of the Lost utterly lost all menace as the series progressed. The Valley of the Lost was an odd Aetherian location. Initially it was written to be a place of dread that no one ever returns from, but as the series continued we saw that pretty much anyone can return from the valley. Three Courageous Hearts, the Rock People and Birds of a Feather. Each of those episodes has a character or a group enter the valley and exit the valley with great ease. In that sense it shares a lot of similarities with Beast Island. Initially thought to be just a misty location, episodes would show the Valley of the Lost to be a rather desolate location with little to no threats, aside from the great monster King Liz, who soon turns out to be a friend. But that's an episode commentary for another time. I've yet to mention the style of the skies over the Fright Zone. The sky was originally used in the He-Man episode Quest for He-Man to show the polluted planet of Trainus. It would later be used in the episode Disappearing Dragons, but on that occasion it was clearly representative of a desolate once great world. The artist sensibly chose to reuse that style of sky for the Fright Zone, a towering, 
almost hellish fortress that seemed to claw its way over the once beautiful land of Etheria. If you want a wonderful example of the scale of the Fright Zone, look at the opening scenes of the episode Into the Dark Dimension. The fortress, as I say, literally claws its way over the land. It's really surprising when you see the angles used by the artists in the opening of that episode. I love the scene of the peasant being placed in the magna beam charger. His defiance and truth is fantastic, causing Adora to doubt herself very briefly, but not enough to arouse any suspicions. Yes, it's a Saturday morning idea, a device that saps the willpower in order to charge a mighty weapon. But there's a wonderful idea behind this. The sheer defiance, bravery and determination of those fighting to end Horde rule means that Hordak will always have a healthy supply of energy for the Magna Beam, which obviously sets up the capture of one of the most defiant, brave and determined men that we are aware of. The scene in which Hordak explains that drained of their willpower the men make perfect slaves is edited out of the theatrical version as a way of saving time. So yes, She-Ra Unchained. As I mentioned, this part of the Sword of She-Ra is written by the supremely talented Bob Ford. He has a slightly different take on the characters, nothing too jarring, but you do see it most with Bo in this scene in the Whispering Woods. Bo's over-the-top bravado and dialogue as Prince Adam prepares to leave was done, of course, to emphasise Bo's tendency to self-indulge and his special way of being full of baloney. So I go alone. You are a brave man, Adam. I salute you. Good fortune speed you on your mission. Yeah, uh, well, thanks. <laughs> this indicates Bob Ford felt that Bo was a comical buffoon and that he refused to treat the character with the dignity Larry Dottilio had done in the first two scripts. In fact, Ford, who pens the season one episode For Want of a Horse, has Shira described Bo in that episode as a brave, wonderful fool. Personally, I love that description for the character. Bob Ford and Larry Dottilio were good friends and would, years later, come together to pen one of the most celebrated Transformer shows with Beast Wars. We're about to see an interesting scene here, once Prince Adam has called upon the power of Greyskull, that is. I mentioned in Into Etheria that the Horde Troopers were originally written to be men in suits. Well, this scene most definitely highlights that and originally showcased it. In the storyboard, after He-Man has captured the Horde Trooper, we see He-Man donning the armour as the man formerly inside the Horde Trooper uniform sits to one side bound and gagged in nothing but silly underpants and garters. I'm always somewhat frustrated that He-Man doesn't remotely feel that his hair is trapped in the Horde Trooper costume. You would think that he should? I have to catch up with your friends before they get inside the fight zone. The Plunder Room is an interesting location that we only ever see in this episode. The script details that the Plunder Room was to be an enormous showplace for every prized and treasured artifact stolen from the Ethereum populace. Sadly, this description was not carried over into the episode itself. It's a shame as that could have not only made for a wonderful visual, but maybe include some easter eggs in there too. And yes, I'm referring to Blackstar's sword. Anytime we talk about easter eggs, we're always going to refer back to Blackstar. Here we see Hordak showing signs of being a Bob Ford villain, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but Larry Dottilio up until this point had written Hordak as calm, cold and calculated, and even when he lost his temper on Beast Island with He-Man, he quickly pulled back and resumed his calm persona. In Bob Ford's script here, Hordak feels constantly on the edge of a Skeletor-esque rage-filled rant. Shadow Weaver, besides her magical properties, appears to be the one to calm Hordak when he gets angry, establishing herself as the peacemaker and problem solver she always would be for him throughout the series, thankfully something that was not taken away. What I love about Hordak and Shadow Weaver's interactions in these first five episodes is that it solidifies the relationship between the pair. They are more like partners than they are master and servant. It's an interesting dynamic that sadly does get lost as the series progresses, but that is mainly due to the writers making Hordak a more typical Saturday morning villain lead and not having a confidant as he does in these first five episodes. It's interesting here to see He-Man believe he has the upper hand on the Horde, but the powerful magics of Shadow Weaver have already exposed his plan. It's not something that we would often see in his own series. But, much like Adam on Etheria, the writers can present and utilise He-Man in different ways than they would be able to in his own series. I love how the pair of villains realise that by capturing He-Man they will have the perfect fuel for the Magna Beam Charger. This was set up perfectly by that slave whom we saw have his strength drained in the beginning. 
That, my dear friends, was called foreshadowing. The Fright Zone was such a wonderful location. As imposing as Snake Mountain was, there was something slightly more menacing and hellish about the Fright Zone. The choice of reds helped create that sense of menace and drama. Of course, the Fright Zone playset would be very different in the Masters of the Universe toy line. The always clever UK Masters of the Universe comic explained this away by saying that the Fright Zone we see in the toy line was Hordak's Eternian base of operations, and when he journeyed to Etheria, he would be back in his mighty metallic fortress. The UK comic also explained why Snake Mountain looked different in the cartoon when compared to the toy line, explaining that the cartoon version was Skeletor's initial base of operations. And He-Man confronts Adora. For a moment, the most powerful man in the universe truly believes that Adora was convinced by the horrors inflicted upon the people of Etheria, not knowing that Shadow Weaver has already once more used her spell of control over Adora. I kind of wish we had seen more of a reaction from He-Man in this scene, like a piece of his soul dying as he realises that his words have failed to convince Adora that she serves the forces of evil. That said, this confrontation is great with He-Man looking pretty awesome in a Horde Trooper costume whilst wielding the Sword of Power, a very simple and effective action figure for customisers to create. Adora for a second time gets the drop on He-Man. This moment is truly shocking when you actually sit back and think about it. For the second time in this opening saga, we have seen He-Man defeated by this evil horde, whom we have known for only three episodes. It's crazy, but it continues to create a great sense of the unknown. How will He-Man and his allies overthrow this mighty force of evil? Hordak is wonderfully calm and calculated in this scene, clearly enjoying his manipulation and control over the entire situation. Adora obviously has strong feelings for He-Man. He made a bond with her during their talk in Beast Island and she really doesn't want to lose him now. And Adora gives us an evil look as Act 1 comes to an end. I think we get the impression that Adora feels connected to He-Man in an honest, truthful way that she doesn't feel with her Horde parents. I do like all the little reactions the animators give to Adora, even though she is acting under the command of Hordak, there is now doubt and uncertainty in her actions. Of course, it is interesting that the story now presents the fact that Shadow Weaver is having to use her magic more and more on Adora, as if there has been a disturbance in the Force. The Horde are not silly and can see the correlation between He-Man's arrival, the sword that Adora carried at one point, and the fact that Adora is slowly breaking free from their control. Here, once again in the Plunder Room, we see a great scene with Shadow Weaver and the two swords. They shock her whenever she touches them and states that they are not of this world. The swords are reacting negatively to Shadow Weaver's magical meddling. Unfortunately, this curiosity would never be nurtured in any future episode. The Horde's interest in Adora's sword fades out right after this instalment. It's very, very unfortunate. In the She-Ra series, the Sword of Protection had seemingly little significance. Speaking of which, Adora's sword is never ever referred to as the Sword of Protection throughout the entire series. That may surprise a lot of people. It would seem there is no distinction in the names of He-Man and She-Ra's swords. In the Season 2 He-Man episode, Origin of the Sorceress, the former sorceress Kudak Ongol calls them the Swords of Power, which seems to hold true here. It begins as night descends on the Fright Zone, Adora's sword begins to cry out. I love this scene. Some care has been taken to design Adora's bedroom. The windows are round circles with a mirror between them. There is a laser cannon by one of them. Adora wakes with her hair tied in ribbons. This was the only time we'd see bedtime Adora. It's an odd coincidence that the Sword of She-Ra, the secret of the sword, was also the first and the last episode to show us the sorceress sleeping. In both cases, the women wake up because of Adora's sword of protection, and in both situations, the sword opens a new door. For the sorceress, it is a dimensional gate to Etheria, and for Adora, it's a metaphorical gateway to her past and to her new life which we're about to see unfold rather dramatically. Once more we find ourselves in the plunder room for one of the most historic moments in the shared histories of Etheria and Eternia. Adora's stern, almost lifeless expressions that we have seen up until now have been replaced with a wide-eyed, concerned look. She is aware that something is not right about her current situation and a truly beautiful scene is about to unfold. 
the sorceress of Castle Grayskull appears to Adora and explains to her in convincing terms of her real identity. None can deny that the sorceress has a wonderful honesty about her, voiced to perfection by Linda Gary. The writing is terrific. Rather than telling Adora she must, the sorceress advises Adora to follow her heart because right now, in truth, that's the one thing Adora can trust. And now we get one of the biggest moments of the series. We, the audience as well as Adora, are confused. Yes, we all want He-Man to be free and save the day. But why should Adora be prompted to care so much for this rebel warrior? The sorceress then utters the phrase that we will never, ever forget. But you also had a twin brother. <gasps> this man is your brother, Adora. The reveal that He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe, is Adora's twin brother. I mean, can you imagine watching this for the first time in the cinema or watching this on TV when it first aired? It must have been incredible. And how perfect the sorceress's last words to Adora for the honor of Grayskull Adora. There's no explanation. Adora knows what to do and it sends chills up our collective spines. The shock and the adrenaline racing, Adora lifts the sword of protection above her head as if it was the most natural thing in the world. For the honor of Grayskull! The princess of power, the leader of the great rebellion, the hope of Etheria born in this single astounding moment. It's fantastic. The transformation of Adora to she is laden with more effects than He-Man's whilst showing Castle Grayskull behind Adora, signifying her roots, her Eternian origin. As Adora transforms into she the Crystal Castle appears behind her, a symbol of her Ethereum destiny. The Crystal Castle wouldn't be explained until Larry Dottilio's episode of the same name, which would air soon after. Actually, the sequence that shows Adora with the Sword of Protection already unsheathed as she begins her transformation into she would later be used in the episodes Battle for Bright Moon, Friendship, Horde Prime Takes a Holiday, The Stone in the Sword, Book Burning, Treasure of the First Ones, Lucky Lends a Hand, The Locket, and The Bibbit Story. It was a very nice alternative to the regular stock sequence. I have to say briefly, one of the fascinating things about She-Ra Unchained is seeing He-Man seemingly defeated and in a truly hopeless situation. Yes, in the He-Man series we saw the most powerful man in the universe imprisoned by his enemies, but rarely did we see him this powerless. The next scenes are pure action and she witnesses He-Man's transformation at the same time. I think she realises that someone else shares her kind of secret. She may also realise the magnitude of power she has just been given. And for the first time we witness the confrontation between Hordak, the Horde and she the Princess of Power. We see almost immediately that He-Man and she are able to work together as a team rather effortlessly. When you think about it, this particular episode, she Unchained, is a landmark episode in she history. The Princess of Power was lucky to receive such an origin story. He-Man was never given a similar introduction, so his past is still rather mysterious. I mentioned that Diane Keener was the artist who designed Adora's final look. Well, she also designed She-Ra's final look, and the character model for the Princess of Power was approved by Lou Scheimer on the 19th of September 1984, just over a year before the first episode aired on TV. She-Ra's crash into the stable and landing on Spirit begins one of my favourite parts as Spirit transforms into Swiftwind almost immediately. Surprisingly, throughout many of the scripts for the series, Spirit is actually referred to as a female horse. I'm not sure whose idea it was to give She-Ra a rainbow-coloured flying unicorn, but it was the work of absolute genius. I am Swiftwind now, dear friend. The dialogue in this scene as He-Man battles the Horde Troopers and confronts Hordak is very Bob Ford. He always seemed to give He-Man a, a confidence in every situation he was in, as well as having a wry smile across his face. I'm always a tad disappointed at the conclusion of this action scene. We have spent the episode learning of the power of the Magna Beam, what it is capable of doing, but the end result is that it glows in some rather basic looking effects for Filmation, who were masters of special effects and the ray is stopped by a boulder, sorry, a big rock, that she tosses into its path, with He-Man subsequently smashing the Magna Beam. I feel that with all the build-up, the destruction of the Magna Beam should have been something a little more impressive and jaw-dropping. And so He-Man and She-Ra save the day, but the story is not over, not just yet anyway. 
The winning moment of this scene is not necessarily the destruction of the Horde's mighty magna beam weapon ensuring the safety of the Whispering Woods, but the rebel prisoners having their energy returned to them. It's quite a momentous moment. We see just how powerful the rebel cause is with the men immediately declaring that they will return to the Great Rebellion mere seconds after regaining their strength of will. In a bizarre way, Hordak's plan has not only failed, but he has created an even more determined band of rebel fighters. What happened? Where are we? Huh? I don't know what happened, but my energy is returning, and I know exactly where we're going. Back to the rebellion, men. Uh, I don't believe we ever feel the threat of He-Man surrounded by a few Horde troopers because a minute or so ago we saw him using his sword to deflect all of their firepower. Still, He-Man does need to escape the Fright Zone and things don't look too good for him at this point. I love Hordak's disbelief when She-Ra swoops in to save He-Man, he's at a loss for words almost. He-Man and She-Ra stride Swiftwind, what a great image. And now we get a fantastic exchange between He-Man and She-Ra. By the way, you were just in time. Well, what are sisters for anyway? Sister? What do you mean? He-Man, I think we have a lot to talk about. Adora, the Force Captain of the Evil Horde, has finally met her destiny through the power of Grayskull and has become She-Ra, Champion of Etheria, the Princess of Power. I should stress that She-Ra Unchained has the least footage removed from it when compared to the other four episodes. Probably because a great deal of important material is contained in this single one episode. Also, imagine watching these scenes in the preview of the next episode. The visuals are just so striking. You'd be sitting there thinking, is that the Horde? On Eternia? She-Ra Unchained, what an incredible episode. Think about it. Adora, the Great Rebellion, Hordak, the Evil Horde, the Aetherian War, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, the legacy of Castle Greyskull, everything we have come to know up until this point has just been turned on its head. I mean, wow, this episode is one of the best of the series. It has everything you could hope for in an origin story, and there's still so much more to come. And that's the end of this commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like, share and subscribe, and I'll catch you on the next one.